welcome. I know you've been watching the news because I I realized it's like live stream. We are going to be topical. We're getting more and more topical every single week we go on. And we really didn't. Well, we kind of meant it to be this way, but maybe not actually so topical as, oh, my goodness, the new prime minister of Italy. Is she prime minister yet? I, I, I'm not quite clear about that. So Giorgia Maloney, right, goes to Hobbit camp. I, I'm, I'm so excited. We got to talk about why. Italians would be going to Hobbit camp and what that has to do with, well, you know, I, I, I saw a little um, clip compilation. I think Paul Joseph Watson posted it where all of the media people were saying the same thing over and over and over again about far right and um, Mussolini and, oh my goodness, nationalism, really dangerous. That's our topic tonight. So welcome to the Mosaic Arc. I've got projects for this woman, but tonight we're going to talk about nationalism. We're on. <laughs> yes. Oh, we're on. Oh, okay. Say hello to the people. Sorry. I was dreaming about Ooh, recording some more, tunes more for you. Hello, more everybody. More tunes, more music. <laughs> yeah, so so um, my brother and I um, made a puzzle together, which has this beautiful image from Aurora Borealis, all in color, and, and Kilts has this wonderful tune that we're going to use to to show that off with everyone. But but tonight we're going to talk about nationalists. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hear tell you haunt chats online and learn things that people are anxious to talk about. I do. What have you what I have do you that. done? What have you been doing and this also week? Self yes, well we went from the queen and empire last week to nationalism. And how do we get how do we get to nationalism now? Why are we worried about that? Um, because everybody's obsessing over what it means. I, why is it so hard? I mean, it's like you got a nation of people and they identify in some way and they create a government together and you got the 19th century. There you go. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Maybe well, we need a bit more history than that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, tell me, tell me what's out there in the, in, in the internets that people are wondering about. The in the internet, the interwebs are buzzing because Georgia Maloney has taken the prime ministership of uh, mm. Italy, and of course, everyone was really excited about it. And then everyone was black pilling and saying it's not going to do anything. She's just another politician. She's saying what we want to hear, um, and so of course, these massive announcements uh, create huge amounts of energy on the internet because everybody wants to uh see the the icon of nationalism mm. emerge and um as you mentioned like the what what is what's the line that every single media talking head has repeated the most since she won the actually election? i should have known it because i watched that whole video it like went on for minutes right the same phrase um the most far right Daddy, daddy, daddy! Since Mussolini, those seem to be the the thing that mattered. Far right, right Mussolini. Far right Mussolini. Yes. So there was that kind of hip, hypnotic phrasing repeated all over the right. media. Uh, so I suppose we're supposed to think of her as a far far right. 
just to the left of Mussolini. Apparently so. Um, yeah. <laughs> Is she far right? Um, uh, nearly as far right as Mussolini? <laughs> I'd no, 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 no. I'm saying that it's like clearly we're it's that hypnotic phrasing that we're we're now meant to be scared of far right, yes. which I mean from what I from what I saw her talk about is she's worried about family and nation and God, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's right. That's uh -huh. the phrase. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the magic phrase that they've chosen. Uh, to focus on. So I suppose that sounds great, but everyone was very unhappy about it because they said it's not nationalistic mm. enough. So I'm watching everyone having arguments about it and uh, poking because I love to poke people. And I love to poke people that think that they're right wing more than I like to poke people that think they're left wing. Why is that? Why is, why is that? Way yeah. more fun. Um, I'm contrary. <laughs> Well, I mean, you did take the name Kilts, for goodness Compulsive. sake. I mean, it yeah. might have been a clue. <laughs> well, we I like to be on the border of things. That's where everything's most interesting. Very well said, yes. So The, the Kilts are, yes. the kilts are uh, border people. The Kilts are definitely bor the kilts bo are border, border people. They're, border They're totally people. border people, mm. yes. So I suppose I'm like a, a kind of border patrol for... Uh, these ideas that are bubbling mm. around because um, I like to test people to see exactly what they believe in and whether or not they're just thinking in phrases or whether or not there are some ideas behind the phrases that they're using. Because the, I mean, for, for example, the, the phrase family means completely different things to different people. Now we've right. changed the meaning of, of words. So if, if someone is calling themselves a nationalist, I don't make assumptions. I like to know exactly what they mean by that phrase. So I poke and I'm like a cactus. <laughs> <laughs> cactus. I mean, but my, my kilts and border people and Scots Irish and that, that may come into our conversation mm. tonight. But it's, it's, say just to say something about family, just to, how do you mean it's it's changed? I mean, we should all, because we are so concerned with, you know, our European heritage and um, the purity of our understanding. Understand that familia in Rome and Roman in in ancient Rome had a particular uh, cat, you know, was category that that was meaningful. Did has that ever come up? Do they do they go back as far as ancient Rome and say what the ancient Roman family was? No, no. I mean, we're talking funny. about Italy most now, are, yeah. So <laughs> most people are sort of hovering around the nineteenth century. Ah, like okay. I think I think that's probably where everyone is uh stuck in no the 19th gone. century yeah yeah there's something about the 19th century i haven't i've not heard any discussion on the ancient uh european ideas yet well so i was Only the 19th century i was trying i was trying out milo was trying to learn latin last year and because i'm competitive with everybody including him um <laughs> <laughs> why would i be that uh I, I, I got the books that he was training with and they're an interesting series because it's a lingua latina and you like learn Latin, not through translation, but was sort of building up from little stories with pictures and things like that. But they start mm -hmm. they start off with the family and, and trying to define the family. Mm -hmm. And well, it's it's the father and the mother, the pater familias and the mater familias and the, and the children and the slaves. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yeah. So family basically meant household, um, and uh -huh. it's uh, you know it's, it 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 was an inclusive category in the sense that it's it's not just the 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 you know the blood group of the the parents and and the children. It's also it's the whole household. So in fact, yeah. I mean, what I find amusing is is modern things like if you watch sitcoms and oh we're a family right you're a family if you're on Friends or. I don't know. I'd, I'd never watch Friends. Like, name a sitcom that people, you know, people talk about having a family together. I mean, Modern Family is interesting, but any group of friends where they suddenly say, oh, this household, we are the real family. Well, in fact, there's good sort of ancient Roman tradition where you kind of did adopt, men could adopt other men as sons if they wanted to leave their property to them. Go figure. They do that in Japan. Yeah. Okay. They still do that in Japan. I think a few well-known businesses. I saw it somewhere. One of the internet pop-ups, but it's still done. 
if they don't have male heirs and they, they want someone to take over the family business, they'll do that. So it's it, it, it rather than appointing a, a, a you know successor CEO, they'll take, find a son and and adopt. Yes, him. yes, they'll they'll adopt him. And he takes the name of the family and he's essentially legally one of the family. Right. Yes. So and that's kind of an adop- adoptive kinship. And that that's, I mean, in ancient Rome, that's the, the, the families, these ancient senatorial families, that they'd have the ma- the death masks of their their ancestors and their family shrines and so forth. Um, you could you could be adopted into one of those those families, and now I'm I'm blanking on particular examples, but the you know the emperors sometimes do this too that they, they need to adopt an heir and make him a, a a Julian or whatever, and and that is authentically family. So maybe so. <laughs> So it, which family? <laughs> you're already wrecking. You're already wrecking a lot of the definitions I've seen flying around. Let, now let's do nationalism. I mean, this woman is the destroyer of worlds. <laughs> I, I, you know, history, history. It's 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 a harsh mistress. You got you know, the moon. The, never mind the moon is a harsh. The history is a harsh mistress. You have to be. We've been talking about this already. You're, you're peeling away layers of the story. And yes, at, w- at what point do you decide this is the truest version of the stories? The 19th century has, I mean, among other things, this very interesting cult of domesticity that develops particularly in Eliz- uh, Victoria, I was about to say Elizabethan, Victorian England of the household mm-hmm. overseen by the mother with the father as the responsible figure. And there are property laws in England by that time that, um, you know, make the woman, uh, uh, the wife, um, behold into the the husband's management and so forth that wasn't the case in medieval england <laughs> property law and, and and inheritance traveled somewhat differently and, and women regularly inherit property in in the middle ages so some of what the imagining of the quote traditional family is pretty shallow historically and you know that the strongest version of it that people tend to be um pointing to or it i used to have a joke um you know, like if you want to know when things that feel like forever started, it's usually around 1850. Okay, so what happened <laughs> then? Oh, the telegraph. No, wait, we're not doing media. Uh-huh. We've already done that one. But no. it's like, it's like, <laughs> it's the middle of, hmm, what, sh- what happens in around 1850? I have a picture. Shall I do it? We, I, you know, I always, I get, we, I need pictures. we go, you we know, go into the pictures. Well, but I, I, you know, unless you like can, can pull yourself up from whatever non-media you're having. Um, I'm now showing them a little map that has this woman sitting on the world. Um, there's some, it's a full map of the world. There's some sea routes and there's particular regions that are colored in pink. Shall I describe to you the regions that are colored in pink? Yeah. Ooh, well, let's see. One of them's most, the Northern part of North America, this little mm-hmm. island off of the West of, the Eurasian Peninsula, um, a little pink bit down at the bottom of, I think that's Africa, a big pink bit in, uh-huh. oh, I think, I can't read it, but I think it says India. <laughs> oh, and a giant pink bit on okay. ooh, where you live. So, ooh. yes. So, and, and I think that woman sitting on the world probably is Britannia. Okay. Um, this this map of the it's um f- and oh it says freedom fraternity and what else does it say at the top there federation so the triple F's of the British Empire which is I mean it, you imagine the peak of the empire it's it's not quite 1850 because you have to like absorb India from the British East India Company and turn it into the Raj um, which happens after 1859 um, but let's see that's when Mill writes on liberty, and I think that's when he loses his job at the East India Company because he gets he he had been a clerk in the East India Company, and then India is absorbed into the empire, and Victoria claims her her title as empress, and voila, mm-hmm. modernity or and you know everlasting tradition. Take your pick. Okay, so. <clears throat> That sounds a little different than what everyone's been describing to me. Oh dear. Mm. Mm. Because I'm not hearing a lot of kinship there. I'm hearing a lot about international trade. 
Yes. Namely, the Dutch East Indies Company. Yes. And incorporating trade zones and a kind of encompassing motto that describes the relationship between people in those trade zones. Yes. Is the British East India Company, were they taken over from the Dutch by this time? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but but it no, it's trade zones and it's I, I will confess to you on, on my journey through whatever conservatism used to mean, possibly. <laughs> Michael Anton had a really good article in American Greatness recently where it's I think it was a speech he gave saying this this what what you know, we really conserved nothing. Um and we're we're back to we're back to the founding, you know, the founding of the United States and saying exactly what are we trying to preserve? They they it was a document Ooh, declaring itself independent from this this network that I just described for you, because of course on this map from the mid eighteen hundreds, you don't have the bottom half of North America <laughs> colored pink. Mm -hmm. um, you, it's its own entity. Which hmm, there was a revolt against. Oh, the British. Um, so I, I did used to have a strong positive understanding of the institutions, the government, the practice of the language. Ooh, we're using English, right? Um, that, mm -hmm. that came from this imperial um, expansion. And I'm, I'm still sort of willing to, to, to throw that around and think about it. It's like, what, what does the extension of parliamentary form do? Um, what kinds of training do you get out of this, particularly mid 19th century understanding of um, how do you run a, a civil service, right? That's why John Stuart Mill had been working for the British East India Company as a clerk. And then it's it's his job vanishes when they absorb India as a as a province rather than as a commercial venture. Um, but he's you know famous for his classical education and such. And he was the kind of person that they then end up stationing out there in India, the the public school educated, stiff upper lip Englishman who brings with him his Englishness and his civilization and his culture and his you know disgust with sati and and we will hang everybody who goes on with that custom anecdote um and uh, you know i st i still love english <laughs> we're gonna do the we're gonna do an episode one day strictly speaking on the, our mother tongue um we have to but the the feeling of exactly what that empire meant has been shifting for me as i um i mean just one as we study more and we talk more but i think also we're we're watching in real time effects of this imperialism playing out in people's dissatisfaction and frustration with the current world order. Um, and, mm. you know, figuring out what that means is obviously part of our project here. It is because uh, there's this relationship, there's a strange relationship in the West with that empire. It's a, I mean, I, this is kind of part of the reason why I'm poking everybody who uh, would describe themselves as right or nationalist. Right. Because the idea behind nationalism is nation and not empire. So I'm poking everyone right. because I'm not seeing a lot of people making that distinction. In fact, they seem to not be able to make that distinction and then describe the relationship between countries that did break off from that trade zone uh that that collective british trade zone and become their own uh entity mm -hmm. so i find that very very interesting because in my in my little uh antipodean perspective <laughs> down here in the southern hemisphere i'm seeing two competing uh trading empires whereas a lot of people that are discussing nationalism in america seem to be referring to themselves as essentially the same as the people that they broke away from, which is, it just confuses me, uh, in, in, in the way that if they're the same, does that necessarily mean that you're a, a distinct nation or are you just rebellious against the trade zone? Okay. What, can, what then? Can what, you give more what makes you a nation? particulars to the the kind of argument that you're seeing? Sure. So, uh, without mentioning 
uh, particular chats. No, <laughs> particular chats. Uh, there, there is a lot of discussion on. Okay, this is uh, the American situation. And I, look, I spend a lot of time talking about America, and people might be wondering why. It's because, as my friend yesterday said, very, uh, very plainly. Australia is now functioning essentially as the colony of the United States. Mm -hmm. So we have a we have a, a great interest in America because, of course, what happens in America is going to happen in Australia with a lag time. So we have to look at your situation. So any discussion on nationalism in America is going to bleed over into a discussion on nationalism in Australia eventually. And from what I'm seeing, everyone is des describing this need to maintain uh, in these particular circles a need to ma maintain this thing called white majority. Mm. Okay. So I've asked everybody to describe this for me because, of course, I poke and I say, why is it that now Italians and Irish are allowed to assimilate into this particular, uh, you know, class? There's a lot of argument about it back and forth, and then ultimately someone will say, well, okay, it means Northern Europeans and it means <laughs> Northern Europeans from these particular areas. I say, okay, all right. What does that mean exactly? Because they seem to put those, even people from that region, in a blender. But from what you've been writing, that was not the case at the founding of the, the American uh experiment so yeah, on my blog yes I've, I've written about yes, this a fair yes. amount on my blog from from some time ago i mean it's interesting how th these di these conversations come up at, at different times i mean it was obviously a big deal during trump's presidency with people being sort of freaking out about the feeling that the united states wasn't a single um imaginary that that they felt mm. they felt like you know different regions were completely different countries. And I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> there is a reason for that. Yeah. Um, and then, and then now, I mean, so we're in the, the online conversation where suddenly things are some Christian nationalism. And what does that mean? And which I, I see as a continuation of some of the same things that were going on under Trump, the sort of, how do we, how do we feel ourselves American well, okay, maybe we, you know, if we define ourselves as Christian, then then that will make sense of this fracturing that we're feeling of of the nation. But what does that mean? Have you have you seen people do any better with Christian than with white? No. Okay. No. It's a it's a <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a it's a it's a trash fire <laughs> in terms of their ability to describe the categories that they're working with, mm. which is why I poke because I like to understand exactly what they're um, they're imagining when they're imagining homogeneity right it, in that I contrast this with what I read in your blog and what I'm reading from other, other writers and it seems that that didn't exist in the in the beginning in the Americas from the outset so Again, it's not really nationalism that they're discussing. Mm. It's imperialism. And there's this uh, constant confusion of the two categories that what they are actually discussing is how we guarantee homogeneity in order to uh, create political stability. So for my, for my mind, that's not nationalism. That's an imperial uh, project. Um, it, it, I mean, it's, it's yes. I mean, the, the 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 great you know the great empires. Let's see when we talk about mm, Rome, the Pax Romana, that's an imperial Pax, mm -hmm. and uh, it's you know enforced by the legions and is you know oppressive. And I, I think we've talked about this in the architecture conversation. Yes, that um, one of the things mm -hmm. that the Roman Empire did was extend itself architecturally, so that you have these identical city centers all around the Mediterranean because the Romans kept building mm -hmm. here you have you know your basilica and for city meetings and here you have your forum and here you have your you know Colosseum or or auditorium and and you just replicate them all around the Mediterranean so that the imperial architecture is carbon copy 
just as you know, mm -hmm. the American architecture is, or you know, thinking about what happens in the 19th century with a lot of civic architecture. Again, it shows up in the Tartarian arguments of saying, how could this all look the same all around the world? And it's like, well, look at the map. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they're, 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 they're purposefully trying to replicate this empire around the world. And it happens architecturally for sure. So yes, empires claim peace. We've been in the Pax Americana for some years now. It seems to not be working quite so well anymore. But uh, mm -hmm. and, and but the, the empire comes with the you know the sort of enforcement of empire as well. So the, yes. there's the military element of this apparent peace, which has a has a different valence okay so there's the commercial empire there's this military and and you know architectural empire the legal empire matters a lot it's like that that was one of the things that i was most persuaded by back in 2015 um reading daniel hannon's book on the anglo tradition of of the legal systems and you know hannon at that point was mm -hmm. a member of the european parliament for the uk uh and um, and I met him on the National Review cruise and things like that. And, you know, he was making what at that time felt like this wonderfully persuasive argument of, you know, that the, the English tradition extends itself around the world. And that that is what brings us peace and stability and, and good government, which is not a national argument at all. I mean, it, it's an, it's, it's an no, institutional I... argument. Sorry. Good an island. Oh. <laughs> um <laughs> I'm foiled by the smallest of things. Well, last time it was the, Beelzebub. Um, this time it's it's whatever it's, it's. It is. I've got Beelzebub, and now the Lone Ranger makeup is getting in my way. You're um, going to explain why you're wearing Lone Ranger makeup eventually. <laughs> I will. I will. Um, so it is an institutional argument. It's still not nationalist. So we're stuck, right? Because. And, and this is why I'm poking everybody because it's it's not because I don't want nationalism or that I'm anti-nationalist and I'm globalist. The whole point of being able to think freely is that you're capable of criticizing things you even agree right. with. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's the great creep. That's the great Greek tradition. It's just argument. So if the, if, if we cannot do this, uh, it's it's useless. I mean, uh, we've 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 thrown the Western tradition out. Um, the the issue isn't no one can define it. They can't define exactly what they want, and it always seems to go back to either commercial, institutional, or mm. imperial. Nothing nationalistic. So I then ask people, well, what kind of people were here before you considered this to be a disastrous uh, situation? Okay, so to get them They'll to think, think, a, think a bit in the past. Yes, yes. Um, you know, let's push everyone's mind out of that 19th century swamp that has sort of sucked everyone into it uh, and then go, okay, we'll go back. Because I, I think everyone is stuck. Everyone is very stuck in it. So what happened before? Who was here before? What was going on in North America? Right. And then I'm getting radio silence or rage. It's fascinating. So it, it disturbs everyone to sort of, I think, uh, meditate on this because then you've got to deal with the, the United States' uh, transition into being an imperial mm -hmm. power. Then you've got to deal with who was colonizing the North American continent. Then you've got to deal with the people that were colonizing the North American continent. And then you've got to start to understand the kinds of people that were colonizing the North American continent. So far, <laughs> no one wants to look at this because it's not convenient, mm. perhaps. But from your blog, you've kind of laid the groundwork for me to, to begin to understand this properly and to describe the different nations that were part of that colonial project in North America. So I really want to ask you about this because uh, you don't describe those people as homogenous at all. Yes, and I'll say I, I, I'm not 
I'm thinking of other things that I want to put in the in the puzzle before we get to that in, in the second. Also, that it's my blog, okay. but it's not my research. You know, I'm I'm riffing off of yes. other people's because I'm not actually an American historian. I'm a can medieval. I, can, medieval let me pimp your oh, blog. Sure. Blog. Me, medieval historian. <laughs> but um, I think I think one of the things thinking about the reactions that you have said that people have had to my argument there, mm. that one of the things that that people seem not to appreciate is the degree to which nationalism as a concept, I mean, anything with these isms on them, you've got to say it's 19th century, right? The isms, the, the, mm -hmm. the, you could say the 19th century is the, the, the century of isms because we have liberalism and capitalism and communism and nationalism and socialism and racism and all of, I, I, and I think I've I've wondered myself in the past, like where did that isminis comes from? But they are um, essentializations of con concepts. And you say that they that you know, and and sure. they are um, it, the nineteenth century. Maybe it's Hegelian, I guess. The chat no. Mel and Casey and and um, Mike one thousand are talking about. Interstate highways and it, okay, I, I'm not quite sure where they are right now. If they figure out what isms are, please tell me. If you all figure out what isms are, um, that they are these like Hegelian categories that need to be realized in truth, or maybe they're Kantian. Who knows? I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'm a medievalist. I don't know. You you guys are not talking proper Aristotelian substance and, and accident. Um, and the 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 feeling that there should be a a perfect realization in any, of any of these i mean we started with maloney and and italy italy doesn't even exist until the 19th century it it's 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 a a region in the roman empire as a province but there's no italy throughout the middle ages there's no italy in the renaissance there's no renaissance italy there's venice and florence and milan and um, Pisa until they get conquered by the Florentines and the Papal States and Naples um, and the two Sicilies and the southern part and it's it I have another so this is city states just for, for for everyone that hasn't looked at uh, this Italy pre nineteenth century Italy these this the the Italian Peninsula is just a collection of city states at this point uh, it, it's even more complicated than that it's some of them are cities. And, and the cities have different kinds of government, right? So um, Florence mm -hmm. is a republic for a while, and the Medici take over it, and then it's really the duchy. Um, Milan is a duchy. Uh, whatever Venice is, is its own thing um, with the, the Doge and the Signoria and, and things. The Papal States are ruled directly by the Pope, so it's more of a monarchy. Um, the you know the 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 French um, in 1494 come down um, and try to invade and take over because that's what the French do with northern Italy <laughs> from the time of Charlemagne uh, and it, it's it, it, Italy as a an you know as a as a as an idea it doesn't even hold together until the 19th century invents it. Um, and then um, so when when you know Mussolini comes along with his, his tradition and you know we're going to be italian it's like he has to invent it too we talked about that last time with the the book yes. you were reading on architecture and memory he has to completely invent it out of disparate local rivalries i mean even mm. to, to agree on what lang what language is italian took some doing <laughs> it's like what language is french oh well the 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 parisians determined that theirs is not the southern france and so instead of the Languedoc and the Languedoc and the I don't know. There's a lot of regional French. Similarly, there's a lot of regional German. All of these entities that we think of as the nations. I'm showing a map now that has a giant octopus on it, which is Russia. <laughs> um, the map, the map is from 1877, and there's a whole series of these kind of cartoon maps of European nations and and they all I, I was trying to, like I, I i found a blog that had like dozens of them and some of them were dogs some of them were characters and costumes some of them were animals i like this one because the octopus is strangling turkey no turkey is kind of the ottoman empire is kind of lying down as a man over the top of turkey and greece you have um actually most of them are human characters except for russia which seems to be oil 
which is topical, mm. right? So this this ex ever. this exercise of imagining nations into existence is very much it's it's contemporary with the British Empire, um, in 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 opposition to the empire as well. It's like this contest between nations and empire is very much a feature of this modern story that we're trying to understand. And so when you know when the the NATO supporting empire wants us all to believe that Maloney is far right. I mean, you can you can basically hear it saying it's it's nationalism versus the the global empire of the 19th century, which is what both the first and second world wars were actually directed against. It was the British Empire. Mm. So. All right, so I'm thinking about this then. So we have the development of these national identities and people have transposed a caricature on them in order to define them as they need to in this kind of environment. Right. So I've seen people uh, posting on this in the last week where they'll say, oh, so the Italians are, you know, they're really warm and they're well suited to roles in uh the arts and cooking and, and whatever, but not so much in, in more serious endeavors, right? So th it's this the character, the, the national blood, character kind of national character, yeah, yeah, like yeah. a national stereotype. The Irish are hot blooded. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, all of these are kind of national stereotypes, but uh, that doesn't leave room for provincial identity. Because what you're, what they're doing is kind of right. placing these superstructures on on an entire group of people which were previously not united, and that would have considered themselves to be unique prior to that superstructure. Yeah, just ask Neapolitans what they think of you know Padua, or it's like they're different. Re they're, I mean, they mm. they were different countries. The, mm. It shows up in Shakespeare's plays of, of the characters, right? If it's a, the Merchant of Venice or Two Gentlemen of Verona and such, all of those are different countries. Uh, mm. And they they have different characters, they have different dialect. And the, the, the you know, even the, like I said, this fiction of there is such a thing as Italy. We've had um, um, Jay from Google says etymology, ultimately from either ancient Greek is the most, a suffix that forms and I see ab, but I'm not really sure where that goes. Okay, so it's it, it, it's it's the classicizing clearly that they're 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 making um, fancy label terms out of classicisms as as a part of it. But um, hmm. we need to we need to understand. What, but recognize isms are always going to be these ideas. They're they're idea forms that you're going to have to hmm. figure out how do you fit the perfect thing into. So nationalism, you're trying to it's like feudalism. Does it ever exist? Can we ever find it? There's whole, you know, whole subfields in medieval history trying to figure out whether feudalism was ever actually a thing. Manorialism. It's it's these structure de st descriptions of structures that come out of the 19th century scholarship that then we argue over the reality of. Okay. You could, you could say it's Platonis Platonism versus Aristotelianism. <laughs> <laughs> Whether there's there's you know uh, idea forms versus uh, you know simply individual examples that then you can collect into a, an idea of category. Okay, so I'm thinking about this in the sense of the British then, because we've got the example of the being. A it, Italy is a construct, right? Versus what it was prior to the 19th century. So, what was Britain? <laughs> Who knows? I have, Just a second. I have to ask you this question. Um, again, when referring to this northwestern European identity that people are consistently referencing. Mm in order to carve out a, a kind of ism now what was going on englishism in English. that <laughs> englishism englishism yeah, english is well so i'd say one people nations invent themselves through story 
mm-hmm. practically, right? We t- and again, we talked about this some last time with the Aeneid and the, the imaginative literature and so forth. And I'd, I'd say this, this fits into our Tolkien theme too in the long yes. term of Maloney and her Hobbit camps. And there are mad, she said, she said at some point, did she say something like I def- I'm defending the Shire or maybe I, I don't know where it's, it's like, so people are, are putting themselves into stories that they very much want to belong in and participate in. And um, I, you can see that in tourism, <laughs> uh, in the mm-hmm. in the way in which people want to go to places and imagine themselves living there. Um, that you know they're usually a little horrified to, f- for example, like in um, Forrester's Room with a View, and when, when the characters go to Florence and they find out, ooh, Flor-, you know, Florence as we imagine it as tourists with the art and the Duomo and the, the you know the the great food and such is not quite the same place as the as it is for the Italians living there. <laughs> Florentine's mm-hmm. living there at the time. So I'd say there's a, there's a story level that you want to imagine yourself into, which is why history is so powerful, right? The, the, you have the, the 19th century inventing all of these national entities, and at the same time, the origin of all of our scholarship, the historiography in the Middle Ages, and the, the, each of these monster countries that I have on, in the map will be writing their own national histories in big scholarly projects over the course of the 19th century. So you're, you're doing this thing of, um, I mean, there's obviously regional framings that, that people are working on. There's story frames that people are creating. And then there's the language that the stories are happening. And I've, and I've, I've said that about, uh, Italy that, you know, we think, oh, Dante's Italy, Dante's Italian is Italian. Well, no, it's Florentine. And to make Florentine, Mm italian the the standard for education is it's it's just as it's you know it's a brutal as i don't know wiping out welsh (laughs) Mm -hmm. which the english try to do over the centuries by you know not allowing the welsh to teach welsh in in their schools and um i mean similarly with you know the scots is the scots and the welsh and the irish all know what it's like having you know the, the the empire come in and say you're speaking this language in your in your classrooms and in your in your schools so uh, these all of these things need to come into the story in order to understand what are we talking about when we're saying who we are, even as English speakers. I have a little example. <laughs> okay, please give, so, <laughs> give us one. So Maloney has said that she, you know, she 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 envisions herself. I think these Hobbit camps are interesting if they want to, you know, give you Shire level belonging to your kin and your and your um community and your locality and stuff like that well tolkien of course was a that uh, you know he, he described himself as a hobbit and liking that um he was also sorry to tell you guys um amazon watchers and so forth really against american cosmopolitanism so the degree to which you want to you know homogenize the world so that we all look exactly the same in, in those forms. He explicitly wrote to Christopher um, in 1943 saying, it'll be horrible if this comes to pass. And this is, he's actually, he's actually in the, in the letter complaining about a number of things, including Winston Churchill. Um, he says, uh, he's, he's, he's talked about Stalin as that bloodthirsty old murderer. Uh, but I also admit that in the photograph, our little cherub WSC actually looked the biggest ruffian present. Interesting. Humph. Well, I wonder if we survive this war, if there will be any niche, ev- niche, even of sufferance left for reactionary back numbers like me and you, the bigger things get, the smaller and duller or flatter the globe gets. It is going to be one, all one blasted little provincial suburb. When they have introduced American sanitation, morale pep, it's a funny, morale pep, right? Um, feminism, and mass production throughout the Near East, Middle East, Far East, USSR, the Pampas, El Gran Chaco, the Danubian Basin, Equatorial Africa, hither, further, and inner Mumbo land, Gondwana land, Lhasa, and the villages of darkest Berkshire. <laughs> How happy we shall be. At any rate, it ought to cut down travel. There will be nowhere to go. So people will, I opine, go all the faster. Colonel Knox says one eighth of the world's population speaks English, in, in quote. And that this is the biggest language group. If true, damn shame, say I. 
May the curse of Babel strike all their tongues till they can only say, ba ba. It would mean much the same. I think I shall have to refuse to speak anything but Old Mercian. Now, ba ba is interesting because that's what um, Paul Joseph Watson used to say. Look at the media going the same thing that they're all saying about Maloney. Ba mm -hmm. ba, far right, Mussolini, far right, Mussolini, ba ba, ba ba, ba. It's like the, clearly the media network has, you know, they're in that uh, homogeneity that Tolkien is, is frustrated with. But look what he's saying. He's making jokes about how everything's going to be American and morale pep and feminism and mass production from the Near East, Middle East, Far East, USSR, Pampas, El Gran Chaco, the Nan Danubian Basin, Equatorial Africa, and then nonsense places, hither, further, and inner Mumbo land, Gondwana land, Lhasa, and the villages of darkest Berkshire. So even regions within England, he's saying, will all then, you know, be the same. And I want to speak Old Mercian. Mm. Which rather suggests oh. that even he, he's famous as writing in English. To him, English was already a problem. This imperial language that had absorbed all of these other regions and dialects. And what on earth is Old Mercian? Do any of your any of your chats know what Old Mercian is? No. I would ask them and check, but I bet they don't. I, do that later. I bet I didn't. Even, so when I'm in graduate school in Cambridge, in East Anglia. I wonder if they know what East Anglia is. I'm in Cambridge in East Anglia, and there's a I, like first or second month I was there. I can't even remember. Um, we're in a uh, graduate seminar, and someone's giving this law this whole paper on Mercia, and I'm like, "Where's Mercy? I've never heard. I don't know Mercia. What on earth is she talking about? It's like it's a real place, apparently. <laughs> it's this this actual region. It's a kingdom. I mean, we don't we don't talk about talk about Anglo Saxons." Maybe we've heard of Northumbria. Mm -hmm. Has anybody here heard of Old Mercian? Anybody here? The language of the Kingdom of Mercia, K Casey says, yes. And Mike, you're right. Mike 1000, he fought the homogenization of language by inventing new ones. Well, interestingly, Tolkien is so fascinating because he understood languages had to grow and have life and have history, which is why he started writing his stories. Mm -hmm. He claimed that languages exist insofar as a people speak them and their stories written in them. But they're, they, they, he, he was, Tolkien was never about, you know, studying only dead languages because he wanted them dead or, per, per, you know, preserved in, in amber or something like that, perspex or whatever you might preserve things in. That nations Formaldehyde. like languages have to have growth and history and, and, and change. That, that anything anything that's 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 you know fixed in the past and and has no life is is a dead thing it's a fossil it's a it's a taxidermy um mm. uh specimen mummified mummified in fact yes <laughs> <laughs> and and remember, it's like saying what's but you know the problem with the the rings of power that they've set it in Numenor and 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 are you know not recognizing that the fall of the Numenorians was because they wanted to like stop time, <laughs> and and they were building pyramids and trying to you know never die and, and doing human sacrifice because the desire to freeze a culture kills it. Mm. I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> Please so, say some more. <laughs> well, that desire to freeze something, to keep it static, Christians don't do this. Mm. We can't do this. By nature of our own existence, we're admitting to uh, the, the, the constant... Uh, growth and life of the church which is living throughout time right. so we have uh new converts which come into the church so the body the body of christ is continuously added to by its converts and then the story of that particular generation in the church becomes a new thing in mm -hmm. christ it's not static or fixed um christianity never changes but it's going to look different depending on the generation that is practicing Christianity because we were on the arc going through that uh, 
that ocean of time. So we're not doing this. However, what you've described is a desire of a lot of people who would describe themselves as Christians to mummify mm -hmm. their culture. We'll find the perfect moment and stick with that one. Mm. Yes. 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 So in language, there's a, there's a, um, a concept in linguistics, you probably know this, where if you're learning a, a brand new language that's not your mother mm. tongue, it's a second language, something can happen called fossilization, which is when the speaker for some reason hits a glass ceiling, they cannot progress in the language and they're that particular level or uh, ability in that new new mm. tongue is fossilized or fossilization. The ling linguists have written about this before. Um, they can't develop with the language. The brain is stuck. So this is what people are just describing when they're describing their nationalism now. Mm. They're, they're finding the perfect time when things were uh, at their best and, and trying to dunk it in formaldehyde by the sounds of it. Um, but does that happen? Well, in, has, that, has that ever happened? Well, on, only insofar as they become tourist attractions. <laughs> and so they're stereotyped. Stere stereotyped and fossilized and essentialized. Um, so some, of the, some of the chat is trying to figure out where Mercy is. Hold on. We're going to tell you where Mercy is. I have maps. <laughs> that's right. So Felis Concolor says, I remember East Anglia, at least regarding Climate Gate. Yes, that's true. The University of East Anglia was big in that. Um, they call me Cordal. I know Mercy is in England, right? Yes, it's in England. Um, it predates the unification of the island, I thought. Yes, and that is actually, this is, they call me Cordal. Um, and happy to confess that why you know it is because you're playing a, a, a video game. I only know that because the Crusader Kings, the game. Yes, good. I mean, it's it's. I I think the game, the gaming world. I know all. I know it only by hanging over the shoulder of people who are actually playing the games, and that that's funny to me. But um, the the level of research that will go into the setups for those, I commend. It's 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 you know many props to those who have learned good, like event history from the precision of the games that you've been watching so that's great i i i remember watching one um one of my family was playing that was um a samurai game and the map of you know feudal japan was incredibly detailed and like how do you know all of that oh it's in the game i'm playing so i okay Professor Volta Brown approves this <laughs> practice you're trying to <laughs> learn yourself into the story which is which is great but um so, and and games are also like a living understanding of how we're getting into the knowledge, right? You want to be participating in that mm -hmm. story, but the only nationalism that is as sort of pure and static as it ought, you're right, it often feels like people want to be in is LARPing. Right? You're, <laughs> you, are, yes. you are wanting to put on the costumes of whatever period or people you thought were and say, this is who we are. Now the 19th century is big on that, right? The 19th century is one long LARP. Um, there's a, you know, a, a phenomenon that Eric Hobsbawm, communist, um, famously wrote about the invention of tradition where, I think it was Hobsbawm, um, studying things like, oh, kilts. <laughs> so, you know, everybody knows, because when you're a tourist and you go to Edinburgh and you go to the kilt shops and they have all the family, the family patterns and you're just like, oh yeah, we were Campbell's or we were McDonald's or we were Fulton's. Fulton's, I don't mm -hmm. think Fulton has a tartan because we're low country, but um, uh, you know, th those, those are the tartans of the families. And my father got really into that because we have Scottish ancestry. And it was like, we need to have the badges of those. And no, they're invented literally for Queen Victoria coming to visit. <laughs> 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 because um, Walter Scott, who's great, great, you know, mythologizer of many things, including the Middle, Middle Ages, um, was so famous in the early 19th century, invents this whole desire for Scottish history. And he, you know, builds himself his own little fake castle at Abbotsford, right? And it's Abbotsford. Mm -hmm. And um, when uh, Albert comes to visit, they have to do this whole pageantry and a lot the the tartan patterning is an invention of that sort of fake ceremonial like for example 
Victoria mm-hmm. and, and Albert dressing up as Philip and Edward the Edward the Golly, I'm, I'm doing this off the top of my head, and then I don't have all my actual exact exactnesses. There's a famous picture of them from 1842 where they're dressed up as medieval king and queen. So that kind of we want the pure version of who we were as a nation. Oh, it's it's very nationalistic, definitely, but it's also an invention of the 19th century. So we're we're back to the 19th century yet again, again. We're just good. You keep you, you keep ending up in the 19th century. Yeah. Which we shouldn't do considering, well, I'm talking to you and you're a medieval historian. <laughs> well, we shouldn't do because we're living in the 21st century. And, and, mm. and uh, although we need to know history, I mean, I think creating national identities out of story, per, I'm, that is how it happens, right? You, you, you do not have a nation mm-hmm. unless you have a story about who you are. Uh, that's that's why the, the 19th century is this huge period of historiography. And again, I said the development of my own profession, because all of these people are trying to figure out how they can define themselves. Germany, again, Germany doesn't exist in this in the 19th century either until the late 19th century. And they have to create the Monumenta Germania Historica, which is this impenetrable source collection it's so confusing because it's like eight different series and stuff like that and and so whoever german Mm -hmm. is it's based in munich um they have to find the historical sources that go into creating them as a people well it includes a lot of stuff that you know some people might consider frankish history so carolingian it includes it doesn't include english stuff because that's an island and it never belonged to the carolingian empire it's so confusing and Yet that is the exercise that people go through to say, we are they, right? That's who we are. We're the people that Mm -hmm. share this story. Therefore, it does matter very much in the United States right now that we're having these big battles over what do we teach in school, obviously. Which story Mm -hmm. are we? Now we can get to my blog. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, to sort of the which story are we and who's we and how do we tell that story and you know, what, what, what direction are we going to be telling that story from? I'll show you the American map now. Shall we show them the American nations? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think you showed this one round in some of your, your online uh, travels. I think Could people started looking at I'm blind. Uh, you're blind. Well, it's one, it's at mm. county level. It's county by county, which I find pretty fascinating. Um, it is a, a, a map from a book by, um, Woodard, um, mm-hmm. I always want to say Woodward, but it's not, it's Woodard, um, called American Nations. And it's showing what he defined as 11 major regions in North America. So it does include Canada because it includes the First Nation. And, and some, of, some of the American nations blend up into Canada too, like the far west. If you feel, if you come mm-hmm. from those um, western, not British Columbia, but the middle ones, Alberta and... Um, oh gosh, <laughs> I'm constantly going off the edge of my detail. Um, anyway, those up there match the ones down the Rockies, right? That far west um, settlement. There's there's similarity of culture even across the Canadian border. Um, similar mm-hmm. similarly, there's a dark blue region around the Great Lakes that tends to blend up into um, New England and so forth. Um, there's a light blue region that's the Midlands. Uh, a, a light red region that's called Greater Appalachia, a yellow region that's called Tidewater, a very red region that's called Deep South. Um, ooh, look, Florida mm-hmm. down there is part of the Spanish Caribbean. <laughs> um, uh, New France, then El Norte, which uh, is you know geographically my favorite part of the country because it's New Mexico, <laughs> um, but is light blue and crosses the Rio Grande. So it's both... New Mexico along the Rio Grande, the southern part of what we call Arizona, and then the northern part of Mexico, uh, also up into Southern California, and then uh, a, a left coast, which is kind of the same color as the blue on the liberal part, but is a little bit different. Yankeedom, yeah. <laughs> Yankees are real. The Yankees are real. And of course, my family all comes from the greater Appalachia, Midlands, El Norte regions, and those people up in New England are damn Yankees. <laughs> I've heard you say this phrase so many times, the damn Yankees. 
what does it mean to be from that uh, from those regions that your family's from well from the regions that my what distinguishes what not distinguishes damn yankees damn yankees we're, we're not damn yankees and evening i'll love this map yes i love this map i could i love one i love maps generally and i love so it's by county by county and the the fun part about it the the truly fun part about it okay so the fultons i i know my grandfather um fulton william fulton was big into genealogy and so he um back in the day before ancestry.com right this was in the 60s and 70s um traced a good deal of our the fulton lineage not interestingly his mm -hmm. wife's lineage and which is a different strand of my uh, heritage um uh and he finds he found that the fultons um they settle in in southern illinois um missouri area my, my fam that they lived my grandfather my fulton family lived in alton illinois when my parent my dad and his sisters were growing up and um but they moved around a fair amount because grandfather was in the air force as a general mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the sort of Fultons are down there in the south. So that puts them in St. Louis area, greater Appalachia, right there in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. But okay. what Grandfather Fulton found was the Fultons had actually originally come from Loudoun County, Virginia. Now, Loudoun County is in, mm -hmm. in, <laughs> in the news a lot because of their school board debates. Well, here we go. We'll, we'll explain to you why they're in the school board debates. <laughs> On that map, Loudoun County is red, which means it belongs in greater Appalachia. Mm -hmm. Literally next door county is light yellow, which is Tidewater, which is Virginia. These are two different cultural regions. And I, I it's like the, the, the sort of Loudoun County part there is very interesting because um, one, I, I've never released, I, I, I've not been there. No, actually been there. I was there this summer briefly because a friend of mine lives there and he, I was stayed at his house. So I've slept in Loudoun County now <laughs> uh, briefly. Okay. Um, that one of the, the, I became fascinated with this map um, when Trump was president or when actually during the election and then when Trump became president because the regions that were strongest in support of Trump tended to become from especially greater Appalachia the Midlands mm -hmm. find him really uncomfortable and embarrassing. The dark blue place hates him. Um, and okay. I'm not as clear on the Deep South. Um, maybe some of some of our chat friends can tell us. Wrangler Star may be from damn Yankee land. Well, bless his heart. Um, <laughs> um, and I was trying to understand, so why, why do the different regions of the country have such strong different reactions to Trump? Mm -hmm. And I was reading at the same time this book, but everybody needs to read all 800 pages of it called Albion Seed by David Hackett Fisher, which is mm -hmm. in fact what Woodard's map is based on because uh, those those regions, the damn Yankee land, the Midlands, Tidewater and Greater Appalachia were all settled by, well, people that you would otherwise call English. Okay. But, but... What Fisher shows in Albion Seed, which is the traditions of the British folkways, the English folkways that come over. British is wrong, mm -hmm. is, is a misnomer. They're English folkways. You have to say British because the Scots-Irish are not really English, and they settle in greater Appalachia. But you get regional differences from England brought over into the colonies. And the best way I can show this is show you a different map, which is, oh, where did I put it? There. Okay, so this this one's a little harder maybe to see on on screen, but um, I have a map that shows those main eastern regions with lines drawn to where they match up on the great Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, mm -hmm. and we learn that oh look, Greater Appalachia tends to be from the north, from Northumbria, sort of borderland, but north North England, um, Tidewater, Virginia tends to come from Wessex, which is down south. Um, the Midlands tend to come from uh, sort of southern Northumberland, and uh, there's Mercia. <laughs> and then damn Yankees come from East Anglia. Okay. And what what Woodard found out, what Woodard, what, what Fisher found out in his study in Albion Seed is you could trace, and he does this in enormous and glorious detail from, you know, very, very local 
down to county records kind of stuff. You can trace the settlers from those main regions in England to the colonies that they found, along with folkways that include dialects, clothing, uh, architectural styles, settlement patterns, gender roles, um, you know, in clothing, like color preferences, right? If you, if you all want to dress wow. like Ralph Lauren, it's, it's East Anglia, right? <laughs> it's these muted, you know, conservative muted preppy colors. Well, they're East Anglian, okay? We mm -hmm. greater Appalachian people really like loud, broad colors and strong gender roles and, you know, fiddle. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but what, what Fisher found was that these, these folkways down to like death practices, marriage customs, on and on and on and on. And it's a fascinating book. It's good. You know, the 800 pages are necessary because you start realizing there was never any such thing as a single America, even at the founding, because mm -hmm. the only way, the only reason that these major regions come together and are able to, you know, sign that declaration and, and, you know, end up in with constitution and stuff like, cause they all hated the British more. It's <laughs> so they were united by a shared hate. They were united <laughs> More than by they their united by an ethnic identity. No, <laughs> I mean they say they're Englishmen, which is true. But for example, and then this gets into there's some blog posts which I'll I'll link when we put this up. Right, there's what what Fisher was very interested in was the different traditions of freedom that come out of these different regions. So mm -hmm. the Yankees, those damn Yankees, they come from a very urban environment in East Anglia. Um, the East Anglians had always been very closely associated with the Dutch, right across the across the mm -hmm. way. Um, there's this other region there that's hard to see, even harder to see on the map, called the New Le New Netherlands, which is New York. <laughs> uh, okay. They don't get necessarily get along with East Anglians either, because and because the Amsterdamers had kicked the Puritans out. Blah 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 blah. It's like you need you really mm -hmm. need to know like in depth medieval, early modern, and modern history, all of it to understand American politics. Um, and we don't, okay. right? We don't. We, we play in these caricature versions of black, uh, black versus white. That's part of it too. Um, you know, red versus yes. blue, when these are all conglomerations and, and, and you know, unstable alliances. Our politics, Italian politics is, you know, famously chaotic and, you know, Maloney may last a year and she'll be average if she does, because that's about how long they, their governments last, because mm -hmm. they have all of these, you know, uh, alliances and, and, and bargains and stuff like that. We do that in our own politics. It just doesn't look quite the same because of the way we do the, the two, you know, the two parties end up because of the way our voting plays out in majority wins and therefore that's it so it's a binary it, it creates a binary for mm -hmm. us but it's 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 just as chaotic and the regional differences are persistent that's another thing that fisher shows over the last 100 pages or so they have affected every single presidential election ever right from the beginning the the regional the regional alliances play out in our um national our federal politics over and over and over again so they're dip, and I'm almost finished with the lecture part here. Um, there's uh, yeah. these four major traditions of freedom in those English settlements. The East Anglians come from mainly urban environment. If you go to Boston and, and mm -hmm. feel yourself creeped out, which I do, because everybody agrees and they're all in it together, <laughs> it's it's a mm -hmm. it's a freedom way that fits with the the Yankees, the, the those East Anglian urban people. Um, it does. Okay. It doesn't work in Virginia, Wessex, which is much more rural, fox hunting, um, you know, farmland and stuff like that. Because Wessex, mm -hmm. curiously enough, was the region of the old English kingdom of Wessex. Right, Alfred is Wessex. Um, they're mm -hmm. much more royalist. They're very much more hierarchical. If you and a lot of mm -hmm. our early statesmen quote, quote, came from Virginia. So they're very much on, you know, tradition and, 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 you know, they're, they're, um, they, they are the Lord of the manor over their serfs basically, but then they divide them mm -hmm. into black and white because they have different color slaves. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, which is, which is, a, it's a, they're transposing a class system that they were already using into the new environment. Right. And, and th yeah. that doesn't okay. go so much into Yankeedom because the East Anglians don't have quite that, social structure they bring over it's like it's like distillations okay. of different regions of england intensified in these american settlements um the midlands are very interesting because mm -hmm. they're quakers 
they are they're kicked out of England, and and Fisher also maps this across the 17th century of the the different moments in the English Civil War. Um, it's like when the parliamentarians are, um, uh, you know, in power, when the royalists are in power. Everybody hates the Quakers; they get kicked out. Um, they show they they <laughs> they settle in the Midlands, mixed in with the Pennsylvania Dutch, and they just they they they're the the sort of image of tolerance ironically since okay. nobody tolerates them because a they won't fight they're they're pathetic mm-hmm. at defending themselves um and 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 this is a feature of problems that they have um and they're very the the, the strong um desire that some americans have always to get along really comes from that that culture the midland culture okay now you will have gathered from my tone in all of this <laughs> that my mm-hmm. people come from a different culture. <laughs> and it took me a long time to understand this. Like, we Scots-Irish going to fight the government because why should the Scots-Irish have ever trusted the English? They come from the border region that was, guess what? Mel Gibson knew what he was doing in Braveheart, constantly the place of battle, right? Every single time the okay. English come through and are fighting with the Scots kings, the borders get overrun they never trusted any government because no government no king ever took care of them and it particularly in the the 17th and early 18th centuries they're the ones that are being kicked off their land by the highland clearances and the you know the the Mm -hmm. the fultons come through ulster so we're um hillbillies too protestant uh, hillbillies The, the the way greater appalachia is is settled is disparate communities that don't really you know hang together but you you know you're going to fight your neighbor the 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 famous feuding right the hatfields and the mccoys and stuff like that that carries mm-hmm. over from the scottish feuding the clan feuds um and yeah this is a this clan behavior it's clan behavior it's it's very much mm-hmm. clan behavior now everybody hates the scots irish i did mention that my grandfather why would, you're so lovable we are and we're good good country music <laughs> I mentioned that my grandfather was a two-star general. Mm -hmm. We're also the American military. Interesting. Therefore, (laughs) Uh it's a very, I mean, it's a very interesting problem. If you want to, if you want to have the United States be this grand empire and go off to war in the rest of the world, you're going to depend on the Scots Irish because they're the military of this country. Interesting. So, yeah. Okay. No, Mel, it's going, going freedom. Just, um, yes, I, you're it's... you're breaking you're breaking my brain right now because I I I'm trying to understand what is the American man. No, what is this entity, this Frankenstein entity? And suddenly I'm seeing that it's hating the English, you're, you're, hating the you're British. Multi, <laughs> yeah, you're you're multinational that have united under hatred. <laughs> Which is some, something quite beautiful about that. We hated that all of these colonies, all of these col- and but some didn't obviously, and they left and went to Canada. Uh huh. Okay. Right. <laughs> oh. Don't get me started on Canadians. Ooh, well, oh. they were they were the Americans <laughs> that didn't revolt, right? So, and uh-huh. Canada, Canada uh. is therefore you know a proof of there was yet another variant in. The responses to the the British now to to be fair okay. okay so all of these people think of themselves in these these four different regions as English they do identify prime pri, you know they think of themselves as you know yes. rights of Englishmen and things like that um, uh, the irony of it is the reason they hate the British so much is by the night the eighteenth century the the English in London the British there's this a new elite upper class that are distinguishing mm-hmm. themselves from the colonies. Who they look look mm-hmm. you know look down on they have ever since us Americans right yes and are adopt Driving are adopting Aussie. affectations including an accent that we mm-hmm. now think of as the British accent right okay you you everybody's always heard you know, it's like oh you know the Appalachians we speak true Shakespearean English sort of. Mm-hmm. The my favorite favorite part of Fisher's Albion Seed is where he goes through all of the the dialects of these these different mm-hmm. regions. They all America the American dialects are the the ancient English uh, pronunciations. 
All of them. Wow. Not just the Appalachians, right? The Tidewater ones. There was a video online recently where there's this one little fishing village off of North Carolina coast or something like that. And nobody understands them. And so mm-hmm. oh, it's the oldest English there is. In fact, if you go through Fisher's word lists for things like critters and you know, mm-hmm. darn tootin' it. I don't know, I'm making it up. My my language, right? I realize my greater Appalachian, Midlands, sort of, not really Midlands, it's kind of, sort of, um, mm-hmm. El Norte, Texan, all of this mixed together. I also lived in Louisville, Kentucky for some of my growing up. My 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 vocabulary cosmopolitan. My vocabulary is cosmopolitan in or in, in in flyover country. But it is mm-hmm. also cosmopolitan. When we moved from Albuquerque, El Norte, to Kentucky, Louisville. The kids in Louisville did not believe we were from America, that, that, that we were from Mexico. They weren't necessarily wrong, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's the, the, I mean, I love America. I, after reading Fisher, I love American history so much because it's so dynamic. Isn't this great? Isn't mm-hmm. this so much more interesting than red versus blue? Good grief. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean... You've just given you've just given an, a a phenomenal ethnogenesis to the U.S. military. That's amazing, <laughs> and it explains a lot. If I have to be honest about the um the bravado of, of uh like the militarism in the states, mm-hmm. it's Scots Irish. Uh, it, yeah, it's not. The, it's not. It's sense. not. It's, so the Yankees send the Scots Irish into battle, and I mean one of the other things that Fisher points out is how that there's different sort of moments in the American Revolution where the part in, in New England is settled fairly quickly. The fighting that carries mm-hmm. on very viciously for a long time c- tends to happen in the, the border. You know, because the border, the border, the borderlands, the, the greater Appalachian people want nothing to do with the British at all, ever again, because they've been kicked okay. off their land. Now, this is the other thing that the, the borderers come into this region having been kicked off their land they are the biggest like refugee migration uh in 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 early modern history it's it's a quarter of a million people it's most of the population wow. of that region show up and live in kentucky and tennessee so that they were completely emptied of native te- territory and mm-hmm. and uh moved move to north america that's fascinating they, yeah they were moved off their land and, and resettled in in the america in in the united states and then so redneck right re, redneck refugees redneck refugees and you you think about all of the that's jokes funny. i mean it's like it, hollywood we go back to the main map right now you can see this mm-hmm. um i mean obviously there are other regions the, the far west woodard does a nice job with the far west because it's basically settled by corporations which can explain your Tonto makeup soon, um, uh, and the railroads and the the the, the federal uh-huh. government. Growing up in New Mexico, we were much more aware of the federal government than I am necessarily in Illinois, for example, um, mm-hmm. because the eastern regions tended to identify by states, which is why the Civil War plays out as states. Right, the states you mm-hmm. identified as coming from your state. Um, if you look at Texas, Texas is fascinating because it's like five countries all by itself. The Deep South, the Greater Appalachia. We need to say something about the Deep South. The Midlands, El Norte, all all of that is is also Texas. So that Texas now as a state can be Texas is is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, New Mexico, with both the the Native American reservations, the Indian reservations, and the national parks, and ooh, this was in the news just now, Los Alamos Labs, which is why. My family was there, which is why we Scots Irish people were there because they were hiring into the labs. My dad was there as a, a surgery resident, but his brother in law was working at the labs. Um, all of that gives the far west this much stronger sort of federal footprint than than okay. other places. And so that Hollywood is always willing to mock the rednecks and the hillbillies, this is what is happening. These are regional differences. Interesting. Uh, I, I'm thinking also, uh, so you've mentioned the, the Deep South, but uh, there's that little area, because I don't know much about the history of this uh, previously f- French Louisiana, mm. but then you've got New Orleans there and you've got the Creoles around yep. New Orleans, which are French speakers. Um, and then you've got your Cajuns, 
And I remember seeing a, a documentary about this uh, Cajun gentleman and he was speaking French and said English is my second language. I, I found that quite striking um, because, of course, you think America, you think English. But mm -hmm. the, the Cajun was saying, uh, I do not want to be Americanized, which was striking because where are you know where are your feet what soil are you standing on it was a north american continent and he was quite um quite insistent that he was speaking french cajun french cajun to his children mm -hmm. and he was giving them french cajun culture and had absolutely no interest in americanizing his children which i, I found fascinating because this is a another uh sort of hitch in the the homogeneity we've got yet another ethnic group down there as part of this um soup of people so what fish fisher fisher has done Hollywood. a david hackett fisher did a history which i haven't read yet of of the french part too so yeah okay. no fish fisher uh, woodard covers these sort of briefly if you're just interested in like the entry mm -hmm. into this story but fisher is the one to like go and he really created this regional historiography as a um, practical uh, scholarly. What do you think, what do you think Hollywood is doing by mocking the uh, redneck refugees then? Uh, I, yeah, good question. Um, because the West is different. The West isn't a, a part of this uh folkway of Al right you know. so well i mean there's the the the, the far west you like the in the in the the woodard map the light yellow far west that's where you have the westerns set and um mm -hmm. razor fist did a really nice rant or short uh, a bit ago on the 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 you know the, the western as a hollywood phenomenon and recognizing mm -hmm. Spaghetti Western. It's, it's spaghetti Western. Ooh, we've got the Italy. We've got the Italy Italians back in here. No, so, yes, spaghetti <laughs> westerns and Sergio Leone and the Italians. The Italians yeah. and the Germans love westerns, which is is mm. is very interesting. They, they they I mean, it's culturally they. I have friends from Germany who it's like they they have these stories in German, like they're not even they're not American translations into German. They're German authors who write westerns, because the the German mm -hmm. German. Um, people love reading about the American West so much that that is a nut. That's the, the powerful mythology, the frontier mythology that we've created. And uh, it's interesting, like who settles in that West, in the, in the far West, because it is a mixture of a lot of these people. It's the, the Yankees, mm -hmm. the damn Yankees are often the bankers funding a lot of it um, from mm -hmm. Boston, very particularly. Um, I don't know about Yankees. Virginians. I mean, if you if you look at if you look at sort of who from these 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 eastern regions settles into the far west, there's not that many people in the far west anyway, but um, they it 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 hovers there as a as a mythology for the United States. I haven't thought about that for today, so maybe we should talk about westerns later. Um, why does okay. Ca California Hollywood mock the hillbillies so much? Mm hmm. I mean that it's part of the coastal problem, right? It's like the maritime, the maritime powers, the edges, the coasts are mocking the land people. Uh, and in that sense, I mean the Scots, the Scots themselves are the land people that the pirates kick out. Mm -hmm. Guilty conscience. <laughs> <Look over there. laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, that's that's really worth it. So I have mm -hmm. I have another map that is um, the the American genome map, which is interesting because if you, you think these political maps are always like completely colored in because you can color in a whole county. Um, this map is showing yes. seven hundred and seventy thousand genomes reveals post colonial population structure of North America. And interestingly, this is what's interesting about n nations. Um, people don't tend to mix up that much. I mean, so I, I, we can do this mm -hmm. American nation thing, saying they're folkways that are sta relatively stable, language ways, you know, dating, marriage, stuff like that. In, in fact, genome studies have apparently shown that the bands of the bands that you can see culturally haven't 
mixed people that much that they, there are bands across the country that fit the the okay. different regions um we have we haven't talked about the deep south i need to talk about that for a second um those are the evil Car caribbeans uh, british evil uh, british um the, the the deep south pirate territory. plantation slavery that they learn how to do from those sugar planters and then come over and they do cotton with it in the in the south but that mm -hmm. the deep south has a different character from even virginia slavery is important because they so? um virginia was those household the household like lord of the manor caring for the serfs kind mm -hmm. of thing um the deep south was industrial industrial okay. plantation slavery and and that so it wasn't the roman wasn't the roman model of the of the family with right the, with the slaves as the part of the household right. it was a completely different system corporate and you can see that you can see that in the stories about like jefferson does he have you know does he have children with his slaves and such it's like the family the family of those virginians yes it included the the slaves because that's the roman model and they're they're all building roman architecture mm -hmm. anyway and thinking of themselves as roman the deep south is industrial production and, and that okay. industrial plantation slavery that came out of sugar production in the Caribbean. So that's the beginning of the vending mm -hmm. machine in North America. It's appropriate. How appropriate is it that Atlanta is where Coca-Cola is? <laughs> <laughs> right there in the deep south, you plantations. plantations. Isn't it? I have so many questions. Okay. Now. So the, the chat, the chat is carrying on. Um, they call me Cordell, says lots of the towns in my region of Illinois have French names still. Yes, there's some missing parts of this story because we've just shown you the English version, right? Can you can you yeah. figure out who's missing on this map? E. Michael Jones did it instantly when I showed it to him. Um, uh, Mel says, so does Wisconsin have the French names, right? So this interior region, mm -hmm. remember Saint Louis, Louisville, where did I say? I've never lived in a place that had an English name. I was born in San Louis. I, you know, was a kid in Albuquerque. Um, I was, and then we moved to Omaha because my dad was stationed at the Air Force Base there because he was mm -hmm. following in the family tradition, right? Uh, and then we moved back to Albuquerque and then to Louisville, Louisville again. And then I um, sleeped, I my, went to high school in Amarillo, Amarillo. Uh, maybe Houston is English, I don't know, uh, college there. And New York, well, that's English, but it was New Amsterdam for original. And now I live in where? Mm -hmm. Chicago? In Illinois? Right, it's, it's <laughs> place name history should just might make your brain explode, which I actually have a mm -hmm. map to go with that for too. Um, recognizing the layers of history that are embedded in all of these stories is 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 there. It's still and people who study English history like Tolkien um, look for that kind of layering of of peoples in English place names too. Mm -hmm. It's not just the English, <laughs> right? Um, weren't they, they call me Cordell? Weren't they the French here fur trading on the river? Yes, they were fur trading on the Mississippi. And um, uh, the Jesuits were also doing mission, so it's it's Catholic, and and there's you know the the the, the like St. Louis is a strong Catholic um, diocese carries over from uh, the it carries over from that French settlement. Okay. It's likewise in New Mexico. I mean that they're Spanish Catholics. <laughs> Wait, so, who's missing from the map? Yeah, someone's missing. <laughs> Who's missing, missing from this map? Chat, what do you think? Manakwa. No, that's not missing. I don't know whether that's missing from the map. Mel asks, and then most of it's German one. Okay, Mel is naming places. They're Wanaki. E. Michael Jones looked at this map. I was talking to him a couple of years ago about, you know, how cool this map was. And he's like, where's the Germans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Irish aren't there either. But no. he just looked at it and said, where's the Germans? Now, what Fisher said was the, the later immigrants come in, these folkways are so well established, particularly in architecture and town planning and governmental structures and, and things mm -hmm. like that, that the newer um, immigrants are absorbed into the local folkways. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, if you know the American Midwest, it's very interesting. It's all German towns. Louisville had a German town. Columbus has a big German town. Um, 
where was I? I mean, to, the, the, you start realizing that a lot of our architecture is very German. I was thinking about language maps that I've seen. Like It used to be back in the early 20th century, what was everyone's second language in regions? If you know, most people spoke English, but the second language that most people spoke at home was, drum roll, no surprise, Deutsch. And there we get the other part of my family history that I didn't know because my Fulton grandfather didn't research his wife's family. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about the wife. <laughs> well, so she had some Scots, they were Mathers, but her maiden name was mm -hmm. Haberer. Uh -huh. So they're Lutherans. I mean, Michael Jones is also aware of all the German Catholics, right? The German migration, mm -hmm into the United States from the middle of the 19th century is enormous. I mean, a lot of them go to Brazil too, but it's, it's, it's very significant okay. that, I mean, one of the things that happens is, you know, 19th century Europe, which we're sort of still looking at prospectively here, is going through all of its upheavals in the 1848 revolution and the people dying of the potato famine in Ireland and such. And many of them come over mm -hmm. to the United States and settle here. And my, my grandmother's family, the Haberers, um, came from the um, Rhineland Palatinate. Yes, okay. I think so. And then my mother's family, my mother's family has has German in it too. There's, they all, and they obviously, they marry into the, the English and Scots-Irish families and such as they settle here. But I wonder why we don't think about the Germans anymore. It's fascinating. It's, 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 it's isn't it? It's, it's the Amish. It's the, well, kid. it's more than just the Amish I, or the Pennsylvania Dutch. It's, it's literally... You know, my, you know, it's, people look at me and they kind of figure it's like, who are you? Where do you come from? What kind of face do mm -hmm. I have? And I look just like my grandmother. I, I found a picture of her um, when she was younger and I, I, I knew I like clearing out some of my father's stuff when he died. And I, I was in shock because I was like that. I, she looks just like me. How can that be? Mm -hmm. I'm also looking like her as a, her, an older woman. Right. You know, it's, <laughs> okay. we're getting the same jowly thing going on here um I, that part of our ancestry has been evaporated in the way in which i mean even david hackett fisher or woodard tell the story of which all these nations are i mean and obviously mm -hmm. there are other layers like chicago is all it's like half polish we've got a biggest polish population here outside of poland <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a huge polish population in in chicago um, I, you know, I think they're more Irish in the United States than there are in Ireland. We have other layers of population, but the German one is, is very, very significant. Do we remember why World War One and World War II were fought? Oh, yes. Hmm. <laughs> About that yes. British Empire, right? <laughs> who were fighting who? Mm-hmm. And that that the the German there's big German communities down in Texas Fredericksburg and everybody goes oh yeah they're Germans like those are the ones we remember, the rest of them mm -hmm. forgot, actively they actively stopped speaking German very purposely after World War One, and then obviously after World War Two nobody can speak German because oh you might be, one of those people. Yeah, so there's an ethnic oblivion then. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just not just the ethnic oblivion of the Native Americans who married into with the, a lot of those greater Appalachians. <laughs> so Elizabeth Warren. This is what I wanted to ask you about. Elizabeth Warren is not necessarily lying. I'm sorry to say. Um, the white Indians. Yes, they're real. All of that settlement across the middle re middle region between the Appalachians and the Mississippi goes on in the 19th century. They do marry each other. That's mm. why we remember all those names. Illinois. <laughs> I mean, it's a French name for the people that were here. Mm -hmm. So this, I've, 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 I put this up because this is, uh, this was quoted in the, uh, in your blog post mm. that those borders that ended up the redneck refugees of Appalachia very readily went native more so mm -hmm. than the other folkways that were transplanted yes. to the North American continent. And they were reviled for doing so because yes. of their easy assimilation into the native American tribes and that they'd essentially gone so native, there was a little difference between them, which I found really funny. Um, because... Which is why they're called Americans. Yeah. The Americans, and we have to say Native Americans now because it's confusing, right? The Scots-Irish Greater Appalachians call themselves American. They're the, they're, 
uh, Woodard says this, that literally, if you ask on a census form, like what, you know, who are mm-hmm. you? What kind of American? We're Americans. American. Make America great again. Oh, right. America. America. Yeah. yeah. We found it for <laughs> you guys. <laughs> so this is interesting that Hollywood mocks the rednecks. Because mm-hmm. it's red skin in that sense culturally yeah not not i'm not talking physiology I, i'm not talking well, about some of it i mean they married each other mm. but the fox day's a... family is evidence of this although he's got mexican mm-hmm. there too but the irish marrying into it's like the, the the these marriage groups and then it's like and i know vox if you're if you ever listen vox which i know you don't watch videos um that this there there is this this marriage into which groups is I mean, it is part of our American story. I mean, maybe we're going to have to do part two on this one and do more Europe because we're, (laughs) this one took, this one took a while to unpack and we're not done yet. Yeah. Uh, But the, the same kind of, you know, both stability of populations, which shows up in this genome map, there, there is real Mm -hmm. stability of most people live where they grew up even now. I mean, it's, it's weird, even, even with, the trains and the railroads and uh, the trains and the interstates and the airplanes and stuff. We still have some Mm -hmm. regional identity left. It's, it's interesting. Um, You can see similar patterns of first migration and then stability in, for example, England, that those, those um, regions that um, the Albion seed maps onto those East Anglian families are there from when they was originally settled there in the seventh century. Um, Wessex is, you know, they're the South, the West Saxons. They're there from a very long time. It's interesting how you'll have migration periods and then plant. Maybe that's what we're going to do now. Maybe people have moved all around enough and they really want to stay put now. They're sick of moving around and that's what we're actually fighting. Yeah, it goes. It goes back to everyone crying about the uh, the mass immigration because then it's a it's another interruption to being able to crystallize that regional identity and form mm. form deep roots and not have movement because mm-hmm. any population change is going to like influence people's ability to stay where they are it's fascinating i don't think australia has had this uh same uh experience Uh, i'm trying to think i'll have to do i'll have to do some research about this but the australians have tended to move a lot australians do tend to move around a lot the region i'd have to i'd have to look at the regional identities we don't have the distinct dialects that the American the American uh, nations have, so I don't think we were I don't think we arrived here speaking those old English dialects. Mm, that's very very different. We we seem at this point it seems more that we are something like California, almost frontier country. Well, I think of you mainly as um, the far west. I mean, the, if, mm. of, I mean I've, I've only visited Australia once, and I did make it from Sydney to Perth so, <laughs> on a plane. Um, Perth is so funny. <laughs> it felt, it, 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 it felt, you know, both, I mean, obviously Sydney's qu- quite urban, port city. I mean, mm-hmm. they're both ports, right? You have nothing but ports. I, maybe I, well, okay, I'm, I'm yep. showing America right now with the far west. There are ways in which we've been talking about the vending machine. The far west is our vending machine area um, in terms mm-hmm. of it really, again, and Woodard does a nice job of this in American nations. It really was settled by corporations. It's, 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 mm-hmm. it, you know, they're, they're, you know, the rugged individualists who go out there and there's not, there's just not that many people out in the west. It was, it was, it was developed by big corporations primarily for, and maybe we should talk about your makeup now. Mining, yes. right? Dun dun dun. dun, dun. dun. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what Australia has as its national right. uh, um, impetus. 
we federated because of mining in interests. So yeah, we are. We're Wild West. We're the Westest West. Yes, the Westest. <laughs> We're still a mining country. Right. We exist. We exist because of mining here. That's it. I did find. I tried I to find a regional map so for cool. Australia, and I, all I found was wine, which I'm showing now. Yeah. <laughs> the regional wine growing. <laughs> It's the only map you need to know. <laughs> I don't know. So I've, I've watched a number of, of Australian stories. Uh, you know, Rake, we, I think we mentioned last mm -hmm. time, which is interesting because he's, he's yes. working within the British barrister legal system, which for Americans is going to mm -hmm. like, ooh, strange and stuff. And it's like, that's when they wear the funny wigs and have to be Queen's the Council and, and things like that. So it feels English, mm -hmm. but I recognize talking with you. No, it's its its, its own thing. Um, as well. Um, so I watched that. And then the other one is, is Miss Fisher's Mysteries, um, which are set in the 20s in Melbourne, right? So there's some lovely buildings that they have for sets there. <laughs> and th oh, yes. There yeah. was one episode when the story revolved around a German family. So this is after in the 20s after World War One, and their wine, their wine, their, their, their winery. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, they've got the Mediterranean climate mm. surrounding Melbourne, so the, there is a climate difference, which would it would make sense that that would be that would be there on the maps. There's a lot. There's a I'm lot of different colored thing. things happening around Melbourne. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> on the map. <laughs> But the but the 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 viticulture, the wine that wine that wine culture and the the regional uh, wine growing regions, uh, I, from my knowledge, has mostly been started and cultivated by continental Europeans. Yeah. It was not an English thing. Okay. Well, it was interesting this so, Miss Fisher episode. It, it was, was a German English. family, and they were worried about mm. losing their their business because of the war. The first war, the great okay. war. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think of whether or not there would have been distinct English identities in each of the colonies. We have we have one dialect which is recognizable in the entire mm. continent, and that's Adelaide, which is South Australia, for everyone that doesn't really know the, the geography of this right. continent. Uh, most of South Australia is Nullarbor Desert, which is in Latin, no trees. There is no, <laughs> there's nothing, nothing grows. So, um, the little peninsula there where Adelaide is, and that was settled by some kind of English. See, now I have a problem because I don't know exactly what kind of English. I do know that some kind of English settled there. And the Adelaide accent tends to be a little bit more toffee, what, what mm. Australians would consider to be more middle-class British. Uh, and almost like the received pronunciation or that kind of old British radio voice almost. But that's fake. I mean, so, I mean, that, that's the radio voice. It's like American radio voice was apparently modeled on more uh, Utah mm. <laughs> Salt Lake or something. Yeah, so the it's into the media voices create this illusion of homogeneity, obviously, but they're they're okay. the blandest, so that everybody theoretically can understand them. That they flatten out. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they bleached. Mm -hmm. It's a bleached dialect. Bleached right. dialect. Okay. So we've got all right. So we've got all of these like port cities, and then we've got the reason the port cities are continuing to function really which is the mining which is the interior so that's right. all which is californian mm -hmm. that's the west which is not folk it's anti-folk it's corporate yep so then you've got the contest between the people who want the corporate and who want the folk right which is pretty much Beautifully described in Cowboys versus Indians. <laughs> sort of. Um, kind of. Kind of. Well, you've got the lawman. 
I mean, the lawman, so the lawman is, we started off at the beginning with the, the British imperial vision, right? And the mm -hmm. sheriff in the Western stories. So the lawman carries the, and, and there's a, you know, high mythology of law in the United States. That's basically what we have. We have law. Um, and mm -hmm. in that sense, you could say that does come from the English tradition very powerfully. Probably want to talk about that some mm -hmm. other time. Um, everybody make notes what we promised you. <laughs> we promised we're going to come back to <laughs> language law. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, as sheriff, right, the sheriff of Nottingham, Walter Scott comes back into this too, because Walter Scott in Ivanhoe is strongly responsible for the image that we have of the outlaw, the outlaw that lives by the law, Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. And he's opposing the sheriff who's the bad king's um, agent. Uh, that, that again, is a 19th century variant on that story, which Walter Scott invents along with the kilt. <laughs> uh, okay. you know, so so a, a, a lot of what's playing out, I guess, in all of these Anglophone regions is, is variants on this I mean, ethnogenesis of the 19th century through England, but the mm -hmm. English variant of the culture always has to include that law. The legal tradition is very powerful and important. So in law, out law. Yeah, yeah. Which is that that frontier tension, right? I'd say it's not the cowboys and Indians because. Um, I mean, one, it's the the American West is more complicated than just the Cowboys and Indians. It's it's also I got the American map back. The El Norte is the Spanish, who have been there mm. in contact with, particularly in New Mexico, with the Pueblo peoples who live in the same regions they were always living. Like they're the 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 Navajo and the Hopi and the Zuni. Um, they actually live in the same place their ancestors lived in for a very long time. So they're the most planted of all of our American populations. The other um, Indian populations got like moved to move from maybe the Seminoles live still in in Florida, but the Cherokee got famously moved to Oklahoma, and then mm -hmm. the Oklahoma Oklahoma got open to American settlement American settlement. Um, what the United States did with the Native peoples, yes, is is uh, both absorb them mythologically and erase them as as peoples and now they have casinos mm. on all of their tribal lands <laughs> talk about talk about sugar <laughs> yes <laughs> the federal government <laughs> gives them casinos to 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 help raise money for the tribes but yeah casino gambling okay come on um the the cowboys end up in competition with the settlers and their big wars in the in the region between the farmers and the cow and the herders Okay. Yeah. So there's miners, there's cowherds, there's settlers, there's the native peoples, there's the Spanish. The West is really complicated too. <laughs> okay. And the French that have been there all along. Who are now absorbed or hiding. Yes, they're in they're in New Orleans. Some of them are in San Francisco. Uh, some of them are in Quebec, obviously. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. So how does one make a nation out of all of these different <laughs> peoples? <laughs> well, you, um, you need it's a myth. a million dollar question. You need, a, you need a story that they all agree that is theirs. Mm. Yeah. That seems challenging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've put on my Lone Ranger makeup. Oh, okay. <laughs> is this is this going to be a story that will get us in? Maybe. Mm. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't really know where I'm going, but that's good because I've got the right character in mind. <laughs> um. So we 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 watched the Lone Ranger because we were we were looking at that Disney Disneyfied mythology of the West. Mm -hmm. What they put in that story was the the European expansion into the Western territories, and then what happened with the Indian tribes, and then of course, out of uh, a lot of these kinds of uh, slapstick events, you get like Lone Ranger and Tonto, who's Johnny Depp, fantastic. But 
the entire thing is on the madness of mining and the madness mm -hmm. of what that's doing to the men who are involved in pulling ore out of the earth. Right. So that's why I've put my makeup on today. <laughs> you, you, you left off the dead bird. <laughs> we need, well, it's a, you, we need... it was really hard to find a crow. <laughs> I, was like, I had very short notice. <laughs> Very hard to find a preserved dead crow. It, it would be appropriate um, that we need it. We need to find you a pigeon, but I'm not sure we'd want it dead. You'll have to have a live no. pigeon. I want them living, yes. just like languages and cultures. Very good, nice mummified. <laughs> uh, uh, which is, you know, it's interesting. So Tonto's walking around with the dead raven on his head. It's like this uh, stereotyping of culture. Uh, what what what's going on? when everybody's sort of stuck in time and they're not and of course he's playing with the the pocket watch mm -hmm. throughout the film so i don't want to give a I no just give it away, give it's, away it's, come on, it's an old it's an old movie if they haven't seen it um, it's their problem all right all right um so he's got this watch which he's received from uh some european guys that i think they're uh, damn, damn yankees are, are they europeans or are they yankees are they yankees are they Bostonian? Well, yeah. I don't remember. Now I have to make that distinction. Yes, you do. I? Because we know we know our American nation. Damn now. Yankees. <laughs> so Yankees roll, Yankees roll up, and this little Indian boy feeds them, and then they see some silver ore, and they ask him where he gets it from. It's from memory. Then he takes them to the the source of all of this silver, and they they lose their minds. So of course they go through the Indian village and they. Massacre, massacre everybody and he's the only one that's left he takes them to the mine because they offer him this silver pocket watch mm. so after the massacre the, the watch is broken it doesn't tick anymore of course tonto is broken as well <laughs> so he wears this dead bird on his head and then for the rest of the film he's on a vendetta quest to get these damn yankees that have massacred his village and done it all for, for silver ore mm -hmm. but it's a really interesting look at what people are trying to do in that we're not telling stories anymore. We're mining. Mm -hmm. The whole of Western culture has become a mining exercise. It's sort of, you know, and so you see it in this film where people are being imported and trucked in and you see you see that whole western frontier uh, economy which is prospectors and then people working on the railroads you see the chinese that have been brought in to, to construct the railroads mm -hmm. the railroads the railroads are constructed to shuttle ore and materials back and forth throughout the rest of the the uh the federation and then you've got the whole houses which i love <laughs> because well you you see how it's it's this kind of uh Degradation of women as economic machines, mm -hmm. which is not a new thing. This is part of the American mythology. It's like the, the the uh, the hookers in the saloon. So yeah, it's it's a very very good um, kind of snapshot of everything. But they're pulling everyone in as this railroad is being constructed, and as everybody's uh, becoming more possessed by the spirit of the silver, which is what Tonto thinks is, has happened to them all. He thinks that there's an evil spirit stuck in the silver, and it's driving them all crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and everyone mocks him for it. But you kind of watch how they're all really losing their mind and people are getting murdered and things are exploding. And uh, you start to realize, is it really the case? Is there a kind of spirit in this awe that is turning us all mad? Mm. And the only way of uh, seeing it would be to kind of twist the mind from the perspective of the, the 19th century or the... The tribal that existed before the 19th century so it's, it's a really good look at both uh like the con both of those contesting ways of seeing the world one is mythological and the other one is empirical yeah so tonto has gone mad because he wants to undo what was done and roll back time and right. he's constantly playing with a broken pocket watch, which seems to me now, after we've had this conversation, that's what nationalists are, many nationalists are trying to do. 
work with a broken watch? Well, they're trying. They're trying to figure out their kilt pattern. Frankly, mm. but that's clan. Um, yeah. And now, what is clan? Well, so I, 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 I one the detail that I would add to um, what happens in that movie is uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto do manage to, you know, destroy this the silver mine and get revenge and such. But the the uh, the re the the mechan the uh, whatever they use to do it object word um is a train mm -hmm. and <laughs> that they drive into the mine that explodes <laughs> and the the thing that mm -hmm. i love that the writers put in that i thought was a really interesting little detail to say that the, the the train that has been pulling all the silver out of the out of the mine and for which the men killed the um tonto's village is named the constitution <laughs> <laughs> so we're back to the law which enables mm -hmm. and it's like we've had a longer you know like there's layers and layers there's always layers in our conversations but the layer of you're saying who are who is who in the story there's still the pirates and the the land people the pirates living mm -hmm. on the maritime and the the people who want to settle and have families and so forth and those pirates wrote the constitution i mean the the, the mm -hmm. united states is I mean, there's there's layers in this in the historical. It's it's founded on like maritime insurance law, among other things. It's like the, the kinds of agreements the Constitution is intended to protect are in fact commercial, um, because the people the <laughs> they're not wrong. The people that are involved in writing it, they're plantation owners. They're the New Amsterdamers who are now the New Yorkers, and they're cosmopolitan traders and. They're the shopkeepers mm -hmm. in East Anglia, and um, so who you know whose side is who on and what? I, I I'm glad that you brought up that the, this mining thing will help people anchor. It's like, what do you do with the land? How do you think about your relationship to the land? Do you do you do you, you know do you live with it with your families? Well, what, you know, are you there when other people had their families there? The border, the Scots Irish borders. I still stand by my people. I mean, they they moved into the region. They recognized that they had enemies among the natives, and then they married them. I like us. <laughs> I know what, I'm saying. what do you do? Fight, or do you want? Or, you know, the other one, right? <laughs> that made me say it. <laughs> <laughs> they both start with the same letter, <laughs> and and the alliterating, uh, the, 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 alliterating appropriately. And you're trying to say, I mean, are we human beings? How do we live as human beings? And it it is interesting that okay, so this came up in the chat, and we will show it now on the map. Is our our conclusion? The one author that I well, no one. Okay, David Hackett Fisher does this with Albion Seed that he shows you the layers of culture that even the English had, right? It's just, even if you're just dealing with the English, you've got four regional variants that are very powerfully mm -hmm. different. And, and then five, if you count the plantations in the South, you add in the Dutch with New Amsterdam, you add in New Orleans with the French and the and the long French occupation in, in, in Louisiana, you add in the Spanish and El Norte, which is, you know, a subset of Mexican culture, which is itself regional and different. You add in, the, you know, the Western settlement and so forth. And then you add in all of those Germans and Irish and Poles and what do you end up with? But American gods. <laughs> and <laughs> Neil Gaiman did it beautifully, right? I, I just, I think that story is so insightful. It is at, at some layer what we modestly are trying to achieve with our own poetry exercises of mm -hmm. realizing the mythology that's layered into everything. And what I love about Gaiman, what I'm showing right now is the map of the journey that they take in the book, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, up north to Wisconsin around to Nebraska and Kansas. They end up back down in Tennessee. It's, it's kind of in parts of the country that I know moderately well from, you know, dri driving a lot when I'm growing up, but um, there's always more to find because what Gaiman did do, I think brilliantly is go around to the tourist attractions <laughs> in the United States and say, these are, inner these are centers of energy, right? They're weird. Mm. They're, they're, you know, it's like, why do you build, you know, North Dakota outside of the Black Hills? I think he didn't go that, they don't go that far. Like 
not only do you have the Black Hills, which was a mining town, you know, mining towns in the Black Hills, you have the caves, the beautiful caves, you have Mount Rushmore, um, massive mm -hmm. federal exercise of domination of, of the landscape. You have also the prairie dog town, the giant prairie dog. <laughs> You know, it's and you drive through southern South Dakota and you get um wall drug, which I think Mel has been to recently. She's gonna comment. Um, you have uh the Corn Palace, which was, you know, it was a event venue decorated with corn cobs <laughs> and mosaics made out of corn. Um, you have little local um uh car museums right if, if you do the proper road mm. trip in in the united states you stop at all of these kinds of attractions and what gaiman does in, in american gods is you know those are the the psychic occult centers with the merry-go-round and the little village in tennessee mm. of the elf you know the gnome garden and stuff like that and 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 then does that also with the place names including things like oh you know, you have the Egyptian characters, you know, uh, running their embalming uh, funeral parlor in Cairo, <laughs> which is very appropriate, mm -hmm. right? That every single people that came to America brought with them their gods, brought with them their, I mean, what is a nation without its mm -hmm. gods? What's a nation, God, I mean, so we started with Christian, in yes. Christian nation. We recognize that the spiritual element of who we are really, really matters. Um, mm -hmm. And we're living in this landscape that is the most confusingly named, you know, I, okay, not this, it, I mean, England is actually very confusingly named too, because the, the, the place name layers are quite deep there from British and Celtic and Roman and, and Anglo-Saxon and Danish and uh, Norman. And yeah, we can do a whole nother, episode on english history um and yes. and gaiman is is recognizing that it's like america is all of these mythologies layered on top of each other in tension with each other and all acting at the same time right that they're all still somehow mm -hmm. alive dinosaurs mel says Mel says, you are speaking to my exact road trip this summer to visit my parents. Yeah, it's if, if, if the land people, if we, you know, if we if we travel on the land, then you find yourself in these stories. I mean, if you want to find American nation, go travel it. I mean, road trip. Yeah, <laughs> live there. Put roots down there. Be in your landscape. Mm. It, it's It's relatively simple and yet the temptation of the cosmopolitan, the temptation of the sea, the temptation of the the vending machine is incredibly strong. The sea gods call. The sea gods call. And we're pirates too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hear them calling. Mm. It's very, very difficult to ignore once you once you're on the sea. To go back to land. Yeah. It is hard. It's very, very difficult. Australians have a, um, I mean, we're port people, but we have this desire, like an intense drive to leave Australia. Yep. It's almost unique, I think, because I don't, uh, I don't know a lot of people that don't have a passport here. We, we get a driver's license and we get a passport and then we leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, so, was, passport, I'm out of here. That's how you, you know, know yeah, well, that's how you know you're an Australian. You've left Australia. <laughs> <laughs> it's we we have a, a a real urge to leave, um, which of course was one of the one of the characteristics that was used to dang, dangle our attention mm -hmm. in 2020 and 2021, because, because of course we were not allowed to leave the continent. Um, and that may not have been such a shocking thing, but we do have a real sea people feeling here. We're poor people. We need the ocean. We need to move. So when we're all locked down and we're prevented from, from leaving and going overseas, I, I don't, I don't know if a lot of Americans really understand exactly what that meant for Australia. Um, because we're not rooted on the land We're we're, we're we have cosmopolitan, uh, port port people and and our clans are not 
in geographical location. The clans are moving, shifting all the time, going between cities and uh, between countries. Um, and so putting hard borders within the Commonwealth of Australia was very, very difficult. So all of a sudden we had some uh, a, a kind of necessity to be landed for a moment mm. without being able to leave. It was a very strange experience. So it's hard. Like I, I will admit it, the co cosmopolitanism is 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 difficult to give up. And then I've I've also said, well, why give it up? Because that's also how Christianity spread. So my argument then is that my inherent cosmopolitanism is not a bad thing. I'll just <laughs> well, just I'm glad you to, I'm glad you Christ. give it to Christ. I brought the Beatus map. Beatus map is our conclusion. Mm. Um. So this is, yeah, so we, I think t this is obviously a to be continued because there's so many layers yes. that are still here, but one of the ones that I find, and, and we need to talk through European history a little more, a lot more, and Christian history and so forth, but the, the, the major quarrel that I have, I mean, so I think the American gods one is interesting because it's saying there's a spiritual reality to a people and we need to c consider what that is. Mm -hmm. um, but Christianity in the, the sort of conversely you say so we all we all see Christ as the logos incarnate into time into story into history and mm -hmm. um I mean that he came into an empire right it's like he's this there's a there's a funny map that maybe somebody posted on um social media today where it's like why are we about to all go to war because things are happening in this circle <laughs> Look at look at that! <laughs> oh yeah, so look that at one. that circle. It's the, like the center of the Eurasian, you know, <laughs> geographical dynamic and the world, you know, island and the world ocean and things like that. And the, Jerusalem was a really well placed place to become incarnate because you're kind of at the center of all of these trade routes mm -hmm. and networks and in the empire. And then what Christ does is send the apostles out to the nations and that's what this map is showing it's a map a famous illustration map of the world from these um uh his, well, it's hispanic spanish um the spanish peninsula iberian peninsula people um the, uh, mm -hmm. commentary on an apocalypse by beatus of liabana uh, but it's famous for its illustration showing the, the the places where the apostles go to in the world and it's an old mm -hmm. style medieval map of a, a T-O so that the Mediterranean looks like the bottom of the T and Asia is placed at the top and Africa's to the, to, wait, <laughs> I'm not sure which side of people are going to oh, see, yes, right? They've gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and you have these little heads around it and those are where the, the 12 apostles go. I and mean, you recognize that there's, there's definitely some in Asia. <laughs> and Africa yeah. and as well as in Europe and that the, in in going to all of the different parts of the world they they bring Christ but though they're they're also the nations they're the the, the apostles to the nations so the great thing mm -hmm. the great thing that happens and this this we can actually credit England with with the positive thing here in in the way that, that it was missionized by Pope Gregory sending the missionaries to Kent um, is that mm -hmm. as as the the church sent mission out, they recognized that people had to have their language, their history, <laughs> their national identity, and and therefore, I mean, mm -hmm. again, they're an authorized audience. What Vox says about the nations being in the Bible is true. That recognized the peoples are real. The the, the apostles mm -hmm. truly go to the nations. Christian nationalism should be, in fact, the you know. We should wear kilts and we should wear, you know, kilts. I've got kilts on my mind. Thank you, kilts. Um, what else should we wear? I don't know. Maybe, this, you know, my well, people should have worn kilts. <laughs> you know, the, the national dress, the, the local architecture, so it's not just all imperial and mm -hmm. identical. Um, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the languages that everything happens in the language. I mean, Tolkien loved Old Mercian. He started translating all of his, you know, he translated 
the great prayers of Christianity into Gothic and Elvish and, <laughs> and such. He recognized mm -hmm. that the, the multiplicity of languages is this garden filled with all of these different flowers and that all of it is alive and magnificent because they're living languages. And he loved, I've talked about this in my Tolkien videos, right? He loves the taste of different languages, that Spanish tastes different from Welsh, mm -hmm. tastes different from, you know, the Germanic languages, which are various, right? There's Old Saxon, there's Old, those are old English, there's... Um, variants of Old English, right? Mercian is one variant of Old English that we know that all of these belong in the church, in the in the, the reality of Pentecost, which is when the apostles are speaking of our Lord, everyone understands them speaking in his own tongue. Mm-hmm. So they got, they, um, In that sense, Christianity is a tension between the cosmopolitan and the folk, yep. which is the city empire and the native, the indigenous, the tribal, or the clan, whatever you want to say it. It's both. It has to be both. And and it's and, and as you know, the incarnation is is our thinking. What's divine human? In Christianity, mm. works in these these intersections between, as you say, the imperial and the local, and that it. I mean, English English is Tolkien was complaining about it in, in his you know nineteen forty three. How much of the world speaks English now? <laughs> it's like this this um, weed. Mm -hmm that covers everything and absorbs all other languages and cuts off and even you know, like receive pronunciation and all of the different dialects of American English that are vanishing into Hollywood speak. <laughs> mm. um, I think that would be a good, uh, a good setting for a conversation on English. Yeah, itself. we could do, cause I told you before, I don't like English and, and uh, I need to tell you why. And then maybe you can help me understand uh, a little bit more why I don't like it. I love English. What are you talking about? Build <laughs> no, I know you do. It's a beautiful garden I, with all I, of these plants in it that have been transplanted from. I'm, it's like a botanical garden of, of, of vocabulary and syntax. And and you can put it in an iambic pentameter. <laughs> I think I'm I'm experiencing English differently because we don't have those four folk ways that mm. the American nations have. That could be it. So my experience, my experience of the English language is different. And because our English has been Americanized so rapidly, I don't think we have folk control over it in Australia at the moment, but that's a completely different conversation. You see, Amel is 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 rejoicing in the chat. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Amel. <laughs> and we're concluding with Christ as the fountainhead, as he is indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so I think we've 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 certainly unpacked a lot here. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I hope there are still questions about the American nations and and our complexity. Um, please study more history, everybody, <laughs> and. Um, think of think of nations as living uh living families rather than as these mm. tourist attractions that you have to s stabilize um although the united you know the american uh you know tourist attractions are really great and fun and you should see the giant um prairie dog outside <laughs> <laughs> it's i you know we want it's... we want we want people to remember their clan remember yes build their families remember their clan but that's see that's the very scots irish variant of it right it's like we mm -hmm. we we are family we belong in our clans we want to be our clans and i i think people mm -hmm. it, it would be interesting to get everybody who's in these conversations that that you're having and put stick them on a map 
and say, yes. where do you identify most with in the folk ways? Then you start understanding the, the reasons they argue the way they do, which is Fisher's point, right? mm -hmm. that, that these regional traditions are so deeply embedded, they just seem true. And, and therefore, damn Yankees, really get out of my business. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I am. I'm, I'm actually going to ask everybody. I, 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 would, I would be fascinated to know now yes. where they would place themselves. Okay, my, my Mike one thousand says largest ball of twine. Exactly. I mean, who who makes these 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 uh, tourist attractions? Right, they're brilliant. I still want to go on the tour of the ones that Gaiman talks about in the story. <laughs> I haven't seen all of. I haven't seen. I, I don't know if I've seen any of them. They're fun. They sound. They sound. Everything the house on the hill up. and the that Tennessee grotto thing that the back the big battle happens at the. I mean, it's. Not only in America, because Europe has similar kinds of, of tourist attractions and invented traditions mm -hmm. and so forth. So this is not just Americans that do it, but we are a subset of the desire to both, um, I guess, escape the land and, and, and plant ourselves in it. And we need to continue to think about how that, how that happens mm. as we sail around in our ark. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. I think it's a good place to leave. Yeah. It. Okay. So we, 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 we want to have been along. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Yankee in the chat at your service. Well, Mike, <laughs> you, I welcome, welcome here. Um, uh, Mel says for love, we fight for love that flows like a river. Casey, New Netherlands. Well, we'll find out where we're all from. My family comes from the New Netherlands and Germany and greater Appalachia and uh, I don't. I, I don't know of any I Catholic Irish. We were Ulster Irish. Um, I am, as far as I'm concerned, as American as the rest as any of you can possibly hope to be. So, I, I nation of me, <laughs> America, America! <laughs> and I mean that. All right. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you.